Uh, cities are so important for creating places of a livable density. In, in other words, they are our best um, hope for um, living in a more sustainable world, a more resilient world, creating cities, places of density where people can live full lives, can live equitable lives, and live healthy lives in, in touch with nature. So how do you create a sustainable city? Uh, first of all, I think it's very, there are five ways to create a sustainable city. Number one is uh, integration of uses. In other words, uses that you don't have a zone for production, a zone for education, a zone for entertainment, a, a zone for, for residential and living, but these are all, all mixed. A lot of the buildings we do have a uh, one use at the bottom and, a, and another use at the top. School at the bottom, residential at the top. Uh, school at the bottom, office building up above, church at the bottom, office building up above, church at the bottom, residential above, synagogue, so, and on and on. So that you really create this sort of blending of uses, number one. Number two, with all the people um, that need to be in these cities from an environmental point of view and from a, from a sustainability point of view, high connectivity. In other words, transit systems that really promote the interaction of people. So we used to talk about transit-oriented development, but now we really talk about transit-integrated development, where buildings on top of the train stations, buses that come into buildings, uh, quick access between one mode and another mode with, with um, offices or, or living spaces above. The third, like like transportation, the third is great urban spaces, great green spaces, great parks. Because again, with more people in the city, with more people in the city, we need more green spaces and more places where people can feel connected to nature and healthy. Sometimes this is a public space, a park, but often it's also semi-public, uh, rooftops of buildings and gathering places. Um, the fourth is something that is really evolution of cities. Uh, you know, so, so often we go to these new districts and so forth and they don't have any soul, they don't have any sense of place, of history, of grit. And I think accident and evolution are very, very important for architecture and for urbanism and creating a sustainable city. Using the buildings we have, reimagining them, re adding on to them taking away from them, but really using the pattern that's there to really enhance and not just start from a flip, rather than start from a fresh slate and build a new, use, the, use what's there um, to build something better. And then finally, the last is, is systems thinking. So that instead of thinking about the building scale, we need to think about the neighborhood scale for, and, and the city scale for, energy production, food production, transportation, um, using our streets in a more holistic way, not just for one type of vehicle mode or another, but more of an integrated way. So the systems thinking is really, from a performance and engineering point of view, really is the way to, to realize the, the, the carbon gains. Uh, I came across this uh, art form called Kintsugi, which is a Japanese uh, art form. Uh, it's called Golden Repair. It's, it means uh, uh, taking a broken piece of pottery and artfully repairing it with, with golden um, uh, uh, lacquer. It's interesting, it dates back to this this shogun, uh, Yoshimasa, who had a beautiful tea set that was broken. He sent it back to China where at that time most tea sets were made. It came back very ugly with staples and he, not such a nice guy, he threw a, threw a fit that only a, a ruler can, can throw and said, I want it back the way it was, you know, I want I want my favorite tea set back, and which of course motivated the craftsmen to find a new way to repair things that just, just not only repaired it, but elevated it. 
Um, interesting, uh, this, during, this was the Japanese Renaissance. Modern times, this, uh, this has turned into uh, you know, a popular art form and you can buy your pre-broken kintsugi or my favorite, the printed kintsugi where it's just printed on, the, on the, the mug, which I'm sure you can order from Amazon and have delivered. But uh, uh, I think when you really, what makes these so special and is such a strong metaphor for how to build in the city uh, is that these craftsmen had the remarkable insight to take something that was already pretty great, the bowl, and after it was broken, transform it, repair it, and, and make it even something better so that this is, it, it really only can be, um, it's so unique. It has to do with, with both the original condition and then the superimposed uh, condition. I was trained uh, in the late 70s and, and mid 80s and so a lot of the basis of urban thought that I carry around it, my here and here comes from that time. And this was a time where there was really a beginning of repairing of, of the city. And uh, there was a famous French urbanist, uh, Michel Cantal Dupar, who was very interested in, at that time, reinvigorating, repairing uh, uh, Le uh, Banyu, which are the suburbs around, which are still today with the yellow shirts, <laughs> are still a, an issue. Um, but these were the underserved, uh, under cared for places. And what he said, this is a sketch from him, what he said to really revitalize places, you need three things. Um, you need imagination, um, you need reason and memory. So uh, without imagination, uh, we just have, we're back to the Shogun, you know, after the thing broke. I just want it back the way it was. I don't want something new. I just want it back, repair it, make it back to Nirvana or, or to paradise that I remember. The, without reason, there's not the technical skills um, to really, create this better future, um, back to our kintsugi metaphor. Some, one can imagine, you know, there are 10 or 15 layers of gold in some of those repairs, that it took longer to make the repair than it did to make the original pot. Um, and then third, without memory, we have, no, we have to know where we've been to where we're going. Just a little digression also in the 70s and 80s. Um, I want to talk about context, interconnection, a little bit about the city. And it's really about context. And we were so obsessed with context and still am, uh, but in that time, it was all about um, relating to the physical surroundings very directly very historically. Subsequent to that and over time, and I hope you can see in the work that we've had a much deeper reading of context. That of course there's the urban context and the architectural context, but there also is the climactic context. and the cultural context, and as I said in the film, they, they are related at the root, you know, that culture and climate are, are very much uh, related. So we've developed a richer, deeper, more potent version of, uh, uh, or reading or definition of, of context. I'm very concerned about uh, um, the way uh, 
international global architecture brands take the same building and they put it in New York, they put it in Shanghai, they put it in London, they, they stamp it on the world. I think this is really a, a problem with globalization and that um, really we need to look very carefully at the sense of place, the uniqueness of each city and each place within the city and each cultural context, each climatic context. So that um, it's a way to take places and enhance their, their character and enrich their character, not take every place in the world and blend it into a sameness. I think that that's a problem. So when we go to, we have a project in, in Istanbul or in New York or Toronto or Amsterdam or, or in China, we always try to find uh, what's particular about the place locally, but also regionally. But, and when I say what's important and particular about that place, we look at the urban context, but also the cultural context and also the climatic context. And the more you understand the history of a place and the more you understand the architecture of a place, you realize that all those things are actually just emerge where culture, uh, climate, and urbanism really come together. I think architecture uh, has been uh, on a very uh, long um, development of creating more and more and more particular object. You know, and they, they, in other words, the building is becoming more and more and more celebrated as an isolated thing. And uh, at the same time, there is a real need as we reurbanize our cities, as we create better and more, more environmentally responsible cities of, of, of sort of systems thinking, of thinking about the whole, the whole setting for the building. And what I really think the next step for architecture, and you're starting to see it in some very interesting buildings, is for there to be um, more of an agreement, uh, less of an opposition between the building figure and the urban ground. That's sort of a detente between the figure and the ground, so that the building has more symbiosis with its, its larger context. I think part of that is this ethos of uh, merging uh, landscape design, urbanism, and architecture so that there isn't three separate realms but that they all come together to create uh, buildings and environments that really span all these three disciplines. And I think that's really where the, the not only where architecture and urbanism wants to go, but where it needs to go in terms of uh, climate change and creating more resilient cities. One of the great things that we do, uh, and one of the things we're very lucky to do, are do very large projects in dense urban centers, whether they're residential buildings, commercial buildings, or institutional buildings. And in those locations, you get an instant feedback. <laughs> if, the, if the apartment doesn't rent or it doesn't sell or it, the building doesn't accommodate the many people that come through it, you hear about it right away. There's, a, there's an instant feedback loop. So it's not that we need to look for the assessment. The, really, the assessment comes very close to us very, very quickly. That's, the, um, that's number one. Uh, number two, from an energy performance point of view, what's really great about um, what's happened over the last decade or so is how much, um, how much sensors are in buildings, how much uh, the technology is gathering data. So we have a much better sense about how much energy is a, a building uses, when it's being used, how many people are in a building at a given time, and that the systems can now start to respond to what's happening in a real-time way. And also we have a really good understanding of how much energy is being used in the building compared to what was designed for. And, and I'm very happy to say uh, uh, most of our buildings, they perform much better than, than our, ourselves and the engineers thought they were going to 
perform. Architecture is such a public act, and now with social media and Instagram and everybody's following everything and you everything is now the public act of building in the city has now gotten you know amplified um, we also have this very strong feedback loop <laughs> in terms of of people understanding uh, what we're trying to do but the, the very very best thing and most satisfying thing for me is that you know when I meet somebody who New York said, where do you live? And they say, the neighborhood, the Upper West Side, and oh, we designed the Circa, and then you really get to, <laughs> you get a very clear understanding, and, and most of the time people say, oh, that's great, I love that building, I didn't know you did that building, and it becomes part of their neighborhood. The difference between architectural design and product design or uh, industrial design is that with product design and industrial design uh, you get to do a prototype you know you do a car and first thing they do is they sculpt it and then they they mock it up and they try it and they and they keep working out the kinks with with buildings you only get one shot you know you design it build it it's done so one of the great things about having a larger firm and a firm that does similar building types again and again is that you start to develop this feedback loop that you get by doing, you know, in the, in the last um, 15 years, we've designed almost 10,000 apartment units that people are living in and put in place and you get to understand more and more how, how this is done. Uh, so when we find, um, when we get a commission, uh, we do two th in creating the team for that. We draw from two from two groups in the office. One group is uh, people who have done the project type before because they know what it takes and they get the benefit of past experience. They get the benefit of having done any number of residential buildings or or office buildings or institutional buildings or interior design projects. But we always also add a. Uh, people who haven't worked on that building type, uh, whether they're more senior or whether they're younger uh, architects coming out, because we think sometimes you know too much about a building and it's good to have a, a fresh look and a, a, a naive look at a, a project or a problem and then really find a way to add and enrich uh, uh, the project so that the end result gets both the benefit of the experience, but also this sort of new, new way to look at a problem. I chose three projects to talk about. And very importantly, they have a balance between these three. And when you think about like a tennis player or a pitcher, you know, with the one arm becomes so big, it's, they've over-exercised one portion of, of their, their body. You know, we know projects and we've done projects that are too, um, too much of one. So maybe, you know, and I, I, I love all, all my other architects, friends, but uh, you know, maybe this one is too much memory and you're a very great architect here, maybe too much a disbalance of, of imagination, and maybe here with the famous apple store, too much reason, too much reduction. And so what we're trying to do is find this balance of all of these things. To have the privilege of working on a building on Central Park, it's very rare because you have this beautiful view, maybe one of the best views in the world, and then you don't want to have a shade come down. Uh, so it really was an idea that, oh, how could you always be in, in you know, have a shade of glass? So um, we also started looking at architectural precedents. Um, this was a very famous competition in, in the 20s in Berlin of this circle and the horizontal energy and one of my favorite 
uh, modernist ar architects, Mendelssohn of the acceleration and the movement, and we use those things together and created something playing up on the acceleration of the natural form of this, this building. And here you can see the sketch, and then the reality where um, we're taking this curved form, we're stepping it up, we're stressing uh, the horizontality, and then this, this sort of progression of the fins really come directly from the modeling of the solar, uh, its performative base. I think there is a sort of direct connection between this and this, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a repair of a place that really needed it, and, but also elevated. So it was a special piece, but that it completed, completed the circle. The contextual side of the building, this one that sort of merges back into the grid is much calmer, it's more, it's more regular, it's more normative. It harks back into the traditional um, Harlem uh, brownstone row houses, uh, but done in a more contemporary way, very crafted way, very, very um, careful way that still had um, scale, texture, and rhythm. And then going into the building, again, the context of this very special place in the city of the greenery and light, how do you bring that into the building and infuse the building and normally when you come into a building especially a large building in Manhattan you go from light into dark it gets darker and heavier and our idea was to really take the outside and when you walk in the first thing you saw was was greenery and light and sort of made the building more transparent and lighter a, as you went in so here it is you walk into the building, the, there's, there's lighting, there's a view to the greenery, there's a view to the outside. Allianz Tower, the second one in Istanbul. Uh, yeah, I was so excited to get this project. Uh, Istanbul always had a big piece of my imagination from a child. Uh, It was just such a wonderful thing. And then, we, of course, we get to the site, and this is what we find. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's just the most generic place, you know, uh, highway, edge, uh, car four across the street, uh, you know, big roof. It was just very depressing. But uh, we realized that, you know, because I was going with the very narrow read of context in my mind, I was expecting to find something very rich. But when, this is also the context, right, of Istanbul, the wonderful uh, profile, and the amazing love of geometry is also the context and the culture, and the landforms, and as we started to craft the building, with the required solar access lines that the local site controls impose uh, on this very strange site that we were started to realize that we had an obelisk type building just by the natural um, conditions of the site, which related very well to the other, the other point. So we started thinking about that more, again, bringing back a more analytical approach. It would say, okay, we want a very highly glazed building. It's an office building. We want a lot of views out, but we want to also control the sun and make sure that it's not uh, too much um, glare, too much heat. Um, so we started analyzing the, the building and looking where the, the, the most amount of, of solar gain on it was. And we had this idea that if we took an all glass building, which is sort of the the default paradigm for office buildings now, and then we added a scrim of perforated panels, we could really then reduce the amount of solar load by about 50% on the building, which is very, very significant. We started, of course, thinking about what 
is a very local response to that historically, which is the Mush Arabia. And of course, this was a screen for solar, but also for privacy um, historically, and how to reinvent that and how to make that into something that was really more contemporary. And we looked at a lot of references and we started with this, which is from the Blue Mosque, which is this beautiful pixelated golden um, uh, architectural painting. Uh, and then we started looking at art. Uh, this is, you know, of course, the kiss and this sort of the golden cloak and thinking about a Paco Rabanne, more contemporary version of a golden cloak over the glass body. This is sunset, the, so the, the sun is setting in the west and it's hitting the, the, the west face of this building. This is looking east, so it really, it comes alive in the evening and really has a very, very strong presence on the skyline and a very, I think, a very, um, this could only be in Istanbul, this building. I don't think it would look good in New York. I don't think it makes sense in Shanghai. I think this is a real Istanbul building. But we had the opportunity to design the first new office building there in a generation. And this was the last one from the last generation. And this is not what uh, uh, Brooklyn is today. This is not what creative office is today. This is not what has driven the explosion of creative work, much like the district we're in right here in terms of design, in terms of fashion, in terms of IT that is really creating um, this very interesting uh, community in Brooklyn. So our idea was to, to flip the building on its head and put it on the park and then create sky gardens. And so the vertical factory, right? So that's what we were trying to make, something that had this connection to the old, the old real strong, we call it in English, a workhorse, a very tough uh, type of building that really uh, works and sort of intersperse that with, with a green ethos. And you know, New York has been doing this well for many years, for generations. Uh, this is the Starrett Lehigh building uh, on the west side, very close to my office. And it really is a vertical factory and it's, it just, um, just stepped up. And of course, I think this is of course the famous McGraw Hill building. This is, I say, the most New York of New York buildings because really what it is, it's, it's a vertical factory with a fancy hat on top, you know? It, it's just, it's really just very, very simple in between and it's, it's all about production, productivity, access to light, very flexible, last over cha changing and, and, and moving and, and it, it's, a, it's a great platform. So we wanted to take those precedents and infuse them with this new idea of greenery like uh, in the Allianz Tower with the Sky Gardens. Again, we were trying to, um, in, in these three projects, show a balance between these three things, memory, connection to a uh, continuum of architecture, reason, a rational, um, rigorous approach to design and imagination, something that's intuitive, something that really takes um, the uh, repair, if you will, to the, to the next level. I'm, I'm very proud for, from the reason point of view that all these are very high performing buildings. They all test the stresses of the marketplace very well. Um, their models of sustainability in their various places and that they're all well crafted and well built. This is to me like the fundamental baseline. In terms of imagination, um, you know, they, I, I'm also quite proud of the fact that all of these buildings you just saw are very, very, very simple 
<coughs> programs. Uh, they're just office or residential spaces. They're not museums, they're not schools, they're not rich in variety, they're very repetitive. But despite that, we were able to, to really um, uh, create rich, formal, unique expressions out of each one of them. And finally, memory, whether Central Park, Istanbul, Brooklyn, each is a unique essay in its place, about its place. Uh, it, it, they, there's some sense of reciprocity or resonance with, with the, the, the place it, itself. Um, so just in conclusion, going back to my friend Creer, um, you know, I think this was, again, maybe from the 70s or early 80s, and I, I, his thesis here I, I disagree with, which was basically you can only have, there's a right choice and a wrong choice. And the right choice for him was small towns, history, large, large cities, modernity, that there isn't, uh, and the top, which was something more nuanced, more layered, something repaired, something evolved, was to him wrong. Mies van der Rohe had a statement about that uh, architecture is the will of the epoch uh, um, translated into space and form. And of course, the modernists were heroic. They were about revolution. That was about changing the world. And really, I think our job, our generation's job, and clearly the next generation's job, is to have an ethos of repair and elevation where we are, we're not um, sweeping clean or creating a global um, style, an international style, but we're doing something that is a series of serial um, repairs, a serial uh, improvements. And, uh, in this way, I think we'll make um, sort of a more connected, a more sustainable, a more enduring, and hopefully a more well-loved city. So with that, I thank you very much. I took one semester of Italian at school and I totally butchered it. So I'm gonna speak English. I don't even, butcher is... Machalayo. Machalayo.